Thanks for checking out this movie review video. This is for the 1974 film Blood for Dracula. Yes, the Andy Warhol Presents Blood for Dracula, which I knew nothing about this film going into it. Uh, it was my first Paul Morrissey film, and I will say, man, that was something. And it really does make me want to watch Flesh for Frankenstein, or sorry, Flesh of Frankenstein, which is another Morrissey film, which is also on Shudder, which is where I watched Blood for Dracula. Uh, but this is a film that I'm going to rate two ways. It's going to be just rated as an overall film, and then it's going to be rated on the so bad it's good scale because it is so bad. This is so bad, but there's so much enjoyment here. Now, you need to know about me. I am a fan of terrible cinema. I find a lot of enjoyment in that. I just kind of love to see terrible cinema and laugh at it, so yeah. Also, I know it's weird to see me without my glasses. I don't wear them every single day. It's just usually days when I'm doing my reviews, but not today. Uh, like I said, written and directed by Paul Morrissey, who also wrote Chelsea Girls, Flesh, Trash, Flesh of Frankenstein, The Hound of the Baskervilles, and Mixed Blood. He did some films early on that looked like maybe they were like softcore porn, or maybe hardcore porn, I don't know, but uh, definitely very sexually based, so you can understand why Blood for Dracula <laughs> is the same way, which at some point during the film, uh, the part where the one daughter takes her top off when they're out in the field... And then the other one decides to do the start doing the same thing. That's when I was like, oh, now I get what this film is kind of about. Because it really does seem like, more than anything, it's kind of a conveyor of nudity and a conveyor of sexual content. Which, you know, it was the 70s. There was no MPAA at that point. Film was doing a lot of different stuff um, over the top, basically. And, um, yeah, I mean, it was a sign of the times, really. And I think that might be why... The 70s is one of my favorite film decades now because they, it was wild. <laughs> it was wild. So Udo Kier is in this, obviously, as Count Dracula. And apparently he lost, supposedly, he lost 20 pounds in a week to play the role. But it messed him up so bad that, like, he was legitimately kind of weak when he showed up and was doing filming because, you know, poor nutrition at that point. So that sucks. So you can kind of see it from time to time with some somewhat lethargic uh acting in there but then again isn't there just lethargic acting in this in general yes the film in general is just lethargic itself the pacing all of that and the runtime's like an hour and 40 something like it's almost an hour and 50 minutes which is insane because it you, you can't be justified like it can't be justified let's be honest so Roman Polanski actually has a cameo in this. Uh, he was nearby apparently shooting a film called What, and they got him to come and do a quick cameo, and he wears this fake mustache, which apparently he also wears in the film What. So he's in the part where, like, uh, Anton is in, like, a bar, and if you look, he's just got, like, this pretty thick uh, mustache. You'll, you'll spot him. He's, like, holding a tankard at some point. You can even just Google image Roman Polanski, Blood for Dracula, and the image will come up so you can see who he was. So Andy Warhol's name being associated with this film is super loose. I was wondering that going into the film. I'm like, did Andy Warhol work on the script? Did it, is Andy Warhol, like, bankrolling this? Like, what? So apparently, from what I found, there was a comment by Andy Warhol stating his involvement with this, which is basically him saying something to the effect of he was going to these parties where Paul Morrissey was and a bunch of other people, and he would kind of throw out ideas like a bunch of other people would at the party, and those ideas were then taken by Morrissey and kind of thrown in the script. So it's kind of like, it's not Andy Warhol's uh, Blood for Dracula, really. I think the name's just kind of on there because they're friends. He maybe got a few ideas from him. And Andy Warhol's name on something probably helped sell some tickets there, or at least get people a little bit interested in the film. So I thought that was interesting. So in the beginning, the close-up of Dracula applying makeup uh, gives a real kind of human closeness to the character for the audience. I did like that as the intro. Also how they then go to like showing him straight on and then going to the uh, mirror where you see no reflection. That was kind of a cool transition shot. And then the chair kind of moving backwards with nobody on it, obviously, because he has no reflection. That looks really cool. I really enjoyed that. And there were some really good directorial, uh, directorial things done within this film. It's just overall, uh, starting with the script, it's not that great. Like, the story is 
very bare bones. The script is very poorly written. The acting is bad. Line delivery is terrible. It's almost like Tommy Wiseau's The Room, which I'm a big fan of. That's my favorite terrible film. And actually, it's funny because I had watched Tommy Wiseau's The Room the day before I watched Blood for Dracula. So then it was fresh in my mind. And I'm seeing these lines be delivered in Blood for Dracula, and I'm like, that is very much like The Room. Like, it's the same type of line delivery, same terrible acting. So I would challenge people. I'd say, watch Blood for Dracula and watch The Room in either order. It doesn't matter. Tell me you don't see a similarity in the way the acting is. It's very, very similar. Um... But I do like that opening thing. It is kind of showing like a bit of a human quality to Dracula in the beginning as he's trying to look as human as possible. And it could be a thing where it's just he's just trying to look human so people won't be reviled by him immediately because he looks so pale otherwise and gaunt. But also it's it could be showing that like he still has a bit of a desire to kind of like relate to people and be kind of human. Now, I was thinking that immediately watching this, thinking maybe it's a better film. So after the film goes on for a while, I was thinking back and I'm like, no, this is probably more of the the whole purpose of just not wanting to scare people off than any sort of deeper meaning about wanting to be human because there's no deeper meaning with this film, really. I think there may have been an attempt at a deeper meaning at one point, which I'll talk about later, but it, it you can't tell. Like, it gets lost because it's so poorly done. Not directorially, though, like I said. The long talk about uh, about what Dracula can bring to Italy is just odd, and that's when I first started getting flashes of Tommy Wiseau's The Room. You know, the, the dialogue uh, between um, Dracula and Anton, his servant, where they're just like, I can bring this, I can't bring that. And it's just like, he even like says that he's worried about just strapping his coffin to the top of the car because it's like, people are going to think that's weird. But then he just does it anyway. It's just... There's a lot of, like, for no reason in this film, and there actually is a lot of dialogue where, like, one thing will be said at one point, and then a little bit later, the total opposite thing will be said by, like, the same character. And you're just like, this makes no sense. You literally just said something different a little bit ago. It's weird. Totally weird. As soon as the one daughter popped her top off in the field, I understood what the film was truly about, especially because of the fact that she's like, oh, it's so hot, it's so rough out here. They hadn't even been working in the field. She used the hoe that she had, like, two times. She, like, two swipes with it and was just like, oh, God, this top's got to come off. It's got to come off, by the way. Best cat dad ever. Just saying. Quick sidetrack. But, yeah, then I saw, I'm like, this is what this film is about. It's about the nudity. It's about the sexual content. And it pretty much is. I like how the first couple Anton talks to is very willing to find Dracula a virgin to marry. Not any questions, really. Uh, that's kind of a theme where people just kind of go along with the whole Dracula thing. I think maybe it was intended that people are that way with him just because, or with that way with Anton as well, just because of the moniker, or I'm sorry, like the prefix of Count to Dracula's name that people just automatically assume, assume he's rich, he's on the up and up, he's a good person probably, we can trust him. Or they're just kind of seeing dollar signs and just being like, man, whoever marries that guy is going to ching ching get some cash but it's just weird because people don't really question Anton or Dracula throughout the entire film for the most part except for Bernardo Bernardo's really the only one he's supposed to end up being the hero in the end but he's not really a hero because he's a sexual abuser um he's a criminal really uh it's yeah I'll talk more about that in a bit I like how when Dracula is complaining about Italy he says nobody will talk to them because they're foreign Anton had literally just been in a lengthy conversation as soon as they got to town. Like, this is what I'm talking about, about, like, one thing in the script and then something, like, totally contradictory a little bit later in the script. Like, literally, Anton and Dracula are having no problems talking to people. They don't even care that they're foreigners, really. They're not asking any questions. They're not suspicious. Yet he's just like, oh, we can't even talk to anyone because we're foreigners. It's, like, predicated on what? You've been doing just fine as soon as you got to town. And this is what I'm saying. The writing is awful. Dracula's freak out of shaking and making random noises on the bed was hilarious. Now, obviously, that was just the first of a few of these to come. I love that. Those are my some of my favorite moments of the film, to be honest. 
where Udo Kier is just going over the top, like with the body shakes and, and puking and just like making all these guttural weird noises. Uh, very hilarious in my opinion. So I love, love, love that part of the film. It's ridiculous. There's even that part where he drinks the first bit of non-virgin blood and they literally tint his uh, skin green. I was like, this is weird and it looks terrible, but it's hokey and it's ridiculous and it goes with the whole feel of the film. Sorry if you hear a dog outside because crappy neighbors. It's wild that the De Fiores invite Anton and Dracula to just come stay with them. Anton is odd, and they haven't even met Dracula at this point. I guess that's supposed to kind of show, like, how hard up they are for money, because they talk about it numerous times within this, that this is kind of like an old money family, family that's crumbling because there's a little bit of, like, social revolution, and also you just get the idea that they haven't kind of managed their money all that well. So they're just, like, desperate. They see dollar signs with Anton showing up and saying, you know, a count is coming and needs a bride. They're like, uh, she can marry into this family. We can get a bunch more money. We don't have to go become destitute, basically. Because, obviously, they don't have any plans to, like, get jobs or, like, find a way to earn income. So, I don't know. But it still f feels weird that they have, like, no questions for Anton. They're just immediately like, why don't you guys just stay here? They don't know who they are. And then... Terrible things happen because they didn't, you know, ask questions or anything. The blood-soaked bread scene is odd. So I got the idea that what had happened is that Anton had killed a virgin and soaked the bread in the blood and then gave it to Dracula and Dracula's like eating it. I, I mean, can Dracula eat bread though too? Because it's not just the blood, he's also eating bread and he doesn't eat anything else throughout the film that's non-blood. So it's like... I don't know. It's it. It's just a weird, weird scene. I didn't hate it, but I was very confused by it. Cool camera work that goes around the bed and then shows the open door and Bernardo, Bernardo standing in the hall. That's right before that, you know, most sexual scene that there is in the film. But it was really cool camera work. And this is what I'm saying. Like, the directing's not bad. The cinematography is not bad. There's some really cool, like, shot angles. There's some really cool camera work movements it's it looks good for the most part it's just a lot of other stuff not so hot a bit odd that one sister ends up watching the other sister bone bernardo and then those sisters start to like kiss and make out and you get the idea they're headed towards getting it on with each other so there's like at least implied incest like borderline incest going on in this it's just it's wild. Like I was saying, like, it's wild. It's like over the top. It's obvious this is mainly just for sexual content. And by the way, I'm going to tell you, like, I didn't even, uh, in my notes, like delineate the names of this daughter, this daughter, this daughter. Like, it doesn't even matter. A, they, they do look kind of similar and B, like, it doesn't even matter who's who in this for the most part, especially with the daughters, because it's just, it just doesn't matter with the story. <laughs> it really doesn't. So no questions about the coffin? Uh, when Dracula and Anton show up with all their stuff, nobody, like, questions the coffin. Bernardo does at one point much later, but initially, nobody in the family says anything. Bernardo doesn't say anything. He does eventually, but nobody's concerned that they're, like, bringing a coffin. I, I do think there is something said about how it's, like, a relative, but, like, that's also weird. Like, why are you traveling around with a rotting relative? Like, it makes no sense. It's ridiculous. Uh, just another one of those things. I like how Anton is such an aggressive ass to everyone. He doesn't even try to, like, lull people in with, like, being fake nice or anything. He's just an aggressive ass to everyone. To everyone. And that's one of the reasons he's my favorite character. Because, A, his that actor's delivery of lines is so terrible. But it's, like, that perfect, awesome, terrible. And then his character of just being, like, aggressive and, and mean to everyone. It's just, like... What is going on? So I, I did kind of want more Anton. Like, there's a decent amount of Anton in the film, but I wanted even more for that reason. Dracula doesn't do a bad job trying to figure out if the one daughter is a virgin or not. Uh, it, 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 then he says he wants to know all the details of her lovemaking, which I don't really understand how that is. Yeah, the first daughter he was really questioning, who ends up not being a virgin, obviously. The only one who was was the youngest one, who was 14, which... Ugh. That's gross, too. 
in this whole situation, especially with Bernardo. But anyway, um, they he's asking and he he's being kind of smart about asking her like indirectly if she's been involved sexually with anyone. So that was fine. But then he gets into like, when he finds out that she has been sexually active, he's like, tell me all the details of your lovemaking. Like, does that really even matter at that point? Because at that point he should understand that that's not the blood he wants. So I, I don't, <laughs> again, script writing. I don't get that. Uh, once again, the violent reaction to the non-virgin blood, hilarious. Uh, one of many of those moments in the film that I love. Bernardo isn't all that important of a character until the very end, but yet you end up seeing him bone quite a bit. And I will point out, it looks like he's terrible at sex. It really looks like he's terrible at sex. Just go back, watch those sex scenes. Well, maybe you don't want to, but if you do, go back and watch the sex scenes and note how he gets it on. It's like, okay, I guess you could do it that way. Once again, going back to Tommy Wiseau in the room. Just saying. It's hard to figure out why the daughters go back to Bernardo with all the terrible things he says and does to them. Yes, the overt sexual assault. The fact that he even talks about wanting to sexually assault the 14-year-old early on in the film. And the sisters are just kind of like... Huh, that's Bernardo. That's the way it is. Let's go have sex with him again. I mean, I guess it seems like it's a situation where, like, they're not allowed to leave the house at all, and I guess they want to have sex, so Bernardo's the only guy around. Like, I don't... It's weird. Like, it's weird. It's it... But, you know, once you get far enough in this film, you understand. Things aren't going to make sense. It's going to be ridiculous. And it is. The wheel, the shot with the uh, camera mounted on the wheelchair with Dracula kind of like going through the house looks kind of cool, but it's really, really, really takes too long. It's like, okay, you had a kind of cool, like inspired shot. Why are you beating it to death? Because pe like, you're not seeing anything. Like you're not, you know, seeing new areas of the house that are interesting. You're just kind of following him for a much too long time. It's just... That's weird. The youngest daughter really is stalked by two predators in this film who want her for her virginity. Dracula obviously wanting her for her virginity because of the taste of her blood and the nourishment he would get from it. And Bernardo, because he is a creep, uh, disgusting human who states from the get-go that he wants to R.A.P.E. her. It's just, so yeah, so she has two predators coming at her. And her parents just might not even, you know, might as well not even be there. Like, they, they don't care about anything in this film. They're just like, look, Dracula, just find one of our daughters. We don't care what happens with her. Give us some money. <laughs> well, I guess the blood from Bernardo taking the youngest daughter's virginity is all Dracula's gonna end up getting. And I do kind of, I do like the scene to a degree of him like on the floor just like slurping that up like it's gross for sure when you think about it but also you know just drinking blood in general is gross but it shows his desperation and that is like one of those moments that's not horrible in the film like it's actually a decent moment in the film it just shows like how hungry he is and to what level he'll sink in order to just get some nourishment in him. And, you know, everyone gets to that point at some point, if you haven't anything to eat. It is obvious the eldest daughter has been bitten because she shows up with a scarf around her neck or some sort of material. And then she's also at, at, acting very odd, and her eyes get, like, super huge, and she's just, like, almost zombie-like in the way she's acting. It's like... It would have been more impactful if they had kind of hidden that or at least tried harder to hide the fact that she was like that because then it could have been a surprise later. But no, I mean, it was it was telegraphed like crazy. I like the gr gradual disembo uh, sorry, dismemberment. The gradual dismemberment of Dracula. I love the kind of like blood spray that comes off. The way it's done because the prosthetics don't look that great and there's no like really great looking gore to it. Um... It just makes it that much more ridiculous and funny, and it fits with the film. I love it. It's over the top. It's ridiculous. The The blood spray is so much fun, and I just love that it's like, there goes one arm, there goes another arm, there goes a leg. 
And then eventually he gets, you know, he breaks it off and stakes him with it. Uh, and then the oldest daughter who has been bitten is like professing her love for him. And she like, I didn't see this coming, throws herself on top of the stake that is through his heart to kill herself as well. Now, I was hoping at that point that the other two daughters who had already been bitten would also come and do the same thing because it would just take it to that next comedic ridiculous level, which, I mean, at this point, why not? Like, you had to know making this film, Paul Morrissey, that it's terrible. It's over the top. It's ridiculous. Like, people are going to laugh at it. You had to know. So, like, just go whole hog and get those other daughters on that stake. Just do it. Have them throw themselves on. It would be awesome. Anyway, that was, you yeah. know. Immediately, the dialogue seems horribly written and is horribly delivered. I already talked about that. Um, there are moments in this film where the lighting is super harsh, especially in the beginning, where, like, faces are being overlit like crazy. So the lighting is problematic a lot of the times within this film. There are a bunch of odd camera angles that give it a quirky feel, uh, and I think the music actually serves to enhance that. The music also is, like, over-the-top and ridiculous, which just kind of adds to the whole feel of the film. You know, you know, thinking about it now, I don't even know <laughs> what the intent was, like, feel-wise, when this film was being made by Morrissey. Like, did he want it to be, like, ridiculous and over-the-top and have people kind of laugh from time to time? Or was he being totally serious with what he was putting out there? I don't know. It's just so hard to tell. There are plenty of scenes that really have no point. Why are they even here? Like, literally, there's a lot of that. And I think that's why, part of why you end up with such a slog through the film. Like, the runtime is way too long for what it is. And with all these kind of, like, for-nothing scenes that are thrown in there, it, it just... The pacing's terrible. The pacing is just awful. And there's really, like, barely any story to it. What's the story? Count Dracula is trying to eat. And the family on the other end, who's, like, willing to give up one of their daughters, is looking for money. Like, that's it. That's it. Like, there's, like, no real intrigue within this film. There's, like, no plot. Every, every character, for the most part, has a very flat affect. That's another thing to note. Like, not only do they act... Not only is, like, the line delivery just, like, poor and crappy, but it's it's flat. Like, delivery has, like, no emotion. They act without emotion for the most part of it. I mean, even during the sex scenes, it's it's not that emotional. Like, I, would say, I was going to say, like, pay close attention, but eh, maybe you don't want to, really. They're not great. All the scenes play out at a lethargic pace, and you can see people waiting for lines to be delivered. That's one of my favorite things in, like, So Bad It's Good films, is when you can see a character waiting for their line. Or you can see a character thinking about acting, and that is going on in this film. Now, that, you know, based on looks, that also reminds me of something I did want to say. I love Udo Kier's eyes. You know, Udo Kier has always had these very piercing, interesting eyes. And I think that's probably the reason that they wanted Udo for the for Count Dracula in this. Because, you know, when the eyes are wide enough or when they're really focusing on the eyes, they're very piercing and impactful and, like, creepy but beautiful at the same time. Which works well for a Dracula character. This obviously tries to show a stark good and evil at play with Dracula needing only pure virgin blood. Basically saying the person must not be corrupted, they must be the most naive, they must be, be the most pure, because it is clear evil versus clear good. That's what's at play here, which, you know, that's a very Dracula thing. There may be some point about how the upper class uses the lower class in many ways, which I think is kind of evidenced by a lot of the stuff Bernardo says about like being lower class and just being kind of treated poorly and things are being are like crumbling as far as the upper class goes. Um, but the problem is it's hard to really pay attention to it because the film's so terrible and unfocused and slow and lethargic like I was talking about. So it's just kind of like, you know, like any point that was there is just lost in the execution of it, to be honest. But all that said, I really really enjoyed it for being a terrible film. So out of five stars with half stars in play as just like a regular film goes, I mean, there is some good directing. I'll give it one and a half because there is some good directing. Like there are a few good things in it. So I'm giving it one and a half stars. But 
as far as like a So Bad It's Good film, I'm giving it three and a half stars. It is definitely three and a half stars for So Bad It's Good. Now, this is where I'd love to know your thoughts on this one. Put it in the comments. Do you love this film? Do you hate this film? Are you in between? Also, do you view this as just like a good film? Because am I missing something? I'm interested in differing opinions. I'm always interested because maybe maybe there's something I'm lo I've lost um, when I was watching it or, you know, something I just didn't consider that may kind of change my feelings on it. I'm not one of those people who's set in my ways about my opinion. I want to hear other people's opinions. It's always interesting to me because we think differently. We experience film very differently. So let's talk about this film or just anything in general. Also, have you seen Flesh of Frankenstein? And if I enjoyed Blood for Dracula the way I did, should I see it? Give me your uh, recommendation down below. Also, do me a quick favor. Hit subscribe if you haven't already. It is quick, painless, costs you no money, and literally does motivate me. I really do appreciate it. At this point, when I'm doing this video, I don't make money doing this. I'm just kind of doing it as A, a creative outlet, and B, a way to kind of build a nerdy horror community because where I live, I cannot talk to people in the nerdy way I want to about horror. I just I just can't. So this is the way I kind of get my nerdy horror fix is putting these videos out and kind of engaging with people in the comments. So would love more people to join up and subscribe. That would be great. Also, if you can, hit the notification bell button because then you'll know when I'm putting up new videos, which I'm doing about four a week. So it's a good amount of content and hopefully people are enjoying it. But regardless, I really thank you for taking your time to watch this. And until next time, keep it brutal.